Now we'll read verse 8. Unto me, so Paul says that this ministry, remember the context of verse 7. The ministry was given to Paul about the body of Christ, Gentiles joining the same body. It was given to him. Verse 8, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. Now isn't that humble? Paul says that even though I'm, I'm the one, out of everybody who's given this task, I'm the least of all saints. So basically, he's pointing you out that he don't deserve it. That's important to understand. He does not deserve it. It was obscure before. And then God made it clear and revealed it only to Paul that time. And then the rest of the people were able to bask in that revelation. So he's like, who am I? Paul says, who am I? Keep reading here. Is this grace given? That's only by the grace of God, Paul realizes. Not that he's talented, he's smart, or he deserves it. It's only by God's grace he's given that. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So Paul is given this blessed, blessed gift that of the body of Christ so that he can preach among the Gentiles about these riches that Jesus Christ has given of the Christian doctrines. Now, we've seen some of those riches at Ephesians 1. That was the context, remember? I mean, what, didn't that make some of you want to run around, shout, and one of our sisters throw a water bottle for crying out loud? <laughs> about redemption, about the rapture, about sealing, about predestination, about election, foreknowledge, the blood atonement, Man, it's such a blessing. Knowing these facts, these are unsearchable riches. It's past finding out. My friend, the, if you remember the context of Ephesians 1 about some of these gifts, they're unsearchable, incomprehensible. One of them, for example, is love. So remember Ephesians 1, Paul mentioned that because based on love, God sees us as holy and sinless, no matter how many times we sin and mess up. So that's unfathomable. That's unsearchable. We can't comprehend that. Man, that's the riches of his gift. Another example was when we looked at Ephesians 1 combined with Ephesians 2, is grace. Grace is unsearchable. All you can say is, I don't know why God would save a wretch like me, especially when you look about your past life and how God delivered you from and gave you so many chances when you should have died a long time ago, like a lot of other people, and you say, I don't know why God was like this toward me. All I can say it was grace. And grace is what? Un incomprehensible. It's unsearchable. Past finding out. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Hence, Paul is so humbled, he realizes that he is the least of all saints, and he is completely undeserving. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. If I were to tell you the greatest Christian ever, perhaps, throughout history, or one of the greatest, if he's not the greatest, is Paul, undoubtedly. Paul became the greatest that we'll ever see throughout history, but... Because he became the greatest was by having the mentality that he is the least. Now, in order for you to become a great preacher one day, a great Christian used by God, a great woman used by God, is to always realize and to have the mentality that you're the worst. Did you hear what I just said? That you are the worst. If you have that mentality, it will keep you humble in the ministry. And then when God puts you on high really well and gives you so much blessing, a lot of people think that you're a great teacher, a great preacher, you're an incredible blessing. Remember this is that you did not have all of that had it not been for God's grace that's unsearchable that he could have given it to a, a thousand others that were better than you. Now remember that and then it will humble you. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 
Now notice he uses present tense, of whom I am what? See, Paul is humble to realize that I didn't get better compared to before. I am still the chief of sinners. So you have to think like that. I'm sorry that people online might view me as arrogant or mean when I try to uh, debunk wrong doctrine and I go hard on other preachers who teach wrong doctrine. Now, I'm sure a lot, majority of you have realized by now why I do that. The reason why is the, the task where you hurt people's lives and souls more than any other thing is being a pastor, not a dictator. Not a dictator like in communist North Korea. It's a pastor. That's the worst damage you can ever do to ruin a person's life permanently because you're talking about a person's soul over here you're feeding, not just their body. So that's the reason why I show them, hey, when you take a preacher, it's not like any normal Joe where you can get ordained online just like that, and then you can take control with that power over people's lives. Shame on you. I mean, that's why they keep compromising, compromising. They don't teach truth, and they try to tolerate different doctrines. Why? Because they want to grow a powerful church and have a huge number of people. Look, me, if I have it that way, then no, that's not worth being a pastor. Keep it small. A lot of people might hate me, fewer people for me. That's fine, because I don't care about a kingdom to control. What I care more about is feeding you, giving you the truth, whether it hurts you or whether you like it. I don't care. I just want to give you something that's best for you. That's what I care about more than my reputation, more than being people pleased with me. Then I'm just feeding my own pride, my own selfish flesh. I mean, you think that I enjoy it? People walk out mad? People disagree with my teachings over here? Of course I don't like that. It hurts, and I wish I could do something more. But I would do you a disservice if I didn't teach you the truth. That's the worst damage I could ever do to you in your life. So uh, remember these facts, folks. That way you can uh, realize that it is very important to be in a Bible-believing church filled with truth. All right, uh, y'all recall what verse that I mentioned over here? <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you. So then by realizing that we are the, that I am the chief of sinners. So people, like I mentioned before, might accuse me of being arrogant, right? For accusing uh, wrong doctrines and different preachers who teach wrong things. Well, the thing is this, is that I'm sorry you see me as arrogant, but maybe that might be a good thing for me. You might say, why is that? Maybe that's a good thing for me. That way they can remind me that I'm the worst preacher out of all the worst preachers that I criticize. Now, you, uh, now, it might be a little bit laughable, but I do mean that honestly. You might say, why so? Because uh, even though that I might criticize these preachers, deep down inside, I really believe this. A lot of those preachers can be better people than me or are better people than me. You might say, really? Yeah, because even though they might teach wrong doctrine, they might even compromise or feed their flesh. Some of them might be better people than me because they might, some of these people are the ones who might wake up five in the morning to pray and read the Bible. Whereas you, Bible-believing Christians who are all right in doctrine, don't. These are the people who might care about how to take care of the poor people, how to get them to church, be patient with these people no matter how many times they complain, while you don't. All right, but I'm not going to get over there, all right? Look, if you pastor a church with 5,000 people, trust me, you get whiners. You get people that's just unbearable. But these pastors have the patience and the love to put up with these people. You don't. All right. Now, uh, before you think that you're better as Bible believers, just remember you might be the worst. Amen. Let's go back. Verse 9. All right. Ephesians 3, 9. All right. Enough of that. We got to resume our teaching here. Let's look at verse 9. And to make all men see. So, Paul, he's given this gift at verse 7 and 8 of the mystery of the body of Christ so that everyone can see what? What is the fellowship of the mystery? This mystery of the body of Christ that they can know about. They can see this beautiful, what we like to call fellowship. Fellowship, which is mentioned at 1 John chapter 1, 
which is fellowship with God. That's why it's called the body of Christ. And fellowship with fellow Jews, fellow brethren, which is also the definition that Paul talked about in the body of Christ. And 1 John 1 clarifies that, fellowship with God and others. That's the point. It's a beautiful fellowship. Beautiful fellowship. And the evidence of beautiful fellowship should be found in a Bible-believing church. And look, no church is perfect, and I feel sad for some onliners who go to some Bible-believing churches and they have the hope and the expectation that everything's going to be beautiful, great people, and it turns out it's not such a perfect church. But you've got to realize, just like our church when I started, man, there were a lot of people who left because the fellowship was not as ideal and beautiful that they thought. It takes a lot of work, so you've got to be patient with the brethren and with the preacher. But nevertheless... Even though it's a working process, we have to strive for this goal that a Bible-believing church, every Bible-believing church should have a beautiful, ideal picture of fellowship. And I hope that visitors see that when they come to this church and that you see that when you come to this church. And as I've told always to newcomers, I mean, if people here have not welcomed you or did not welcome you, please let me know. All right? It should be the... Uh, the best fellowship you should find is not at a, is not at a bar for crying out loud. Yeah. For crying out loud, that's not where you find beautiful fellowship. It's got to be in church. Good, fellowship of the mystery, latter part of verse 9, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. So this mystery of the body of Christ, see that purple warning, was obscure. This beautiful fellowship of the body of Christ, it was obscure all the way at the beginning of the world. The beginning of the world in Christ. Yeah. It was obscure at the beginning of the world in Christ, and it was hid until when? The Apostle Paul, as I mentioned before. Now, remember the Calvinists, uh, they always say that, you know, God... Uh, hit it a long time ago, and then he elected you. But notice that it's based on a basis here. It's based on the basis of verse 11, the latter part, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, a condition. If you receive Christ for your salvation, you get in Jesus Christ, then you become a part of this fellowship of the body of Christ. Uh, I'm not going to expound on that. Uh, let's just go back. Who created all things by Jesus Christ? So, God is the one who created all things by Jesus Christ. So, notice that Jesus Christ and God the Father, that they were in unison together when they created all the universe. So, Jesus is God. Jesus is part of the deity of God himself in the creation of the universe. Uh, 